Hi, Biology 210. This is Joy Colley. We're off to a pretty good start this semester, so we're going to go ahead and continue with the lecture material. We're going to look at Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we're going to divide into two sections, so there'll be two separate videos associated with this material. This is the first part, and we're interested now in some chemistry, the chemical level of organization. Now, even though this is a biology course and you're getting biology credit, all biological organisms are based in part on their chemistry. That's part of the hierarchy that we talked about in chapter one. So we're going to get a little bit of an introduction to some chemical terms. We're not going to be chemists by the end of this chapter, but we are going to understand the terminology, the way that chemists approach material, and that's going to be beneficial when we talk about our own body. We kind of transition into the discussion of our metabolism and our physiology. So we're going to get some good chemical terminology that's going to help us out in this course. We start out with the very basic idea that all matter, living, non-living, our own bodies are composed of anything that occupies space and has mass. That's our official definition coming from your online textbook. And we know that matter can occur in three different states. You might have heard of this, states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. That has to do with density, how close the molecules are to each other. But when we think about our human body and we think about solid, well, our organs, our tissues, our bones are solid. We also have liquid matter. Think about blood, think about digestive juices, cerebrospinal fluid. We're also processing gases like oxygen that we breathe in, carbon dioxide that we breathe out. So our body interacts with all states of matter. And matter is composed of elements. We have a definition. These are uh, substances that are composed of only one kind of atom and they come from the environment. So we see these naturally occurring in the environment. We find them in our foods, in the things that we take in, in the chemicals that we process in our body. Some examples of elements, in fact the four most common elements in the human body are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, we're adding some things into the blank there, and nitrogen. Chemists love to abbreviate elements. They love to abbreviate a lot of different things. And when they do that for elements, we get what's referred to as the atomic symbol. That's once again the shorthand or the abbreviation for an element. Example, C for carbon. So C, the letter C, is carbon's atomic symbol. H for hydrogen. O for oxygen. N for nitrogen. Those are pretty straightforward, just the first letter. Now, that's not always the case, but for these four important chemicals to our body, it is. You might be familiar with this beautiful thing. Ah, this gorgeous, gorgeous thing is a periodic table of the elements. If you've ever had a chemistry class or a previous biology class, you might have seen something like this. But what we see in the little squares are lots of atomic symbols, and there's some more that are important biologically that crop up every so often in our metabolism, like calcium or sodium or iron, uh, potassium, and we're recognizing those atomic symbols. We're not memorizing the periodic table, but we are recognizing the chemicals that come up in our own metabolism. So we'll use a few of them as an example and get a little bit more comfortable with a few of them anyway. So these are elements. That's a wonderful chemical term, as is compound. A compound to a chemist are two or more elements bonded together. Bonded means they're in a particular relationship. They're different types of bonds because they're different types of relationships. But two or more elements bond together like this one as an example. CO2 carbon dioxide. Now I'm saying the words carbon dioxide, but you see on the screen CO2. That's another abbreviation. CO2 is the chemical formula for carbon dioxide. It's shorthand. It indicates two oxygen atoms. Two oxygens are bonded to one carbon. There are millions of compounds, but a couple more that might sound familiar. H2O, that's the chemical formula for water. Two hydrogens bonded to an oxygen. Here's another one, sodium chloride. NaCl, that's table salt. We also have glucose. A little more complicated, a few more players here, but um, the chemical formula for glucose, we need this for the notes, C6, H12, 
O6. That indicates there are six carbons bonded to 12 hydrogens, bonded to six oxygens. They're all in some sort of relationship. That's an important organic compound, so we mention it now just as a beautiful, gorgeous example. We're going to see glucose again, so we made sure we got that into the notes. So we have elements, we have compounds, and elements themselves are composed of atoms, atomic structure. This is a term that should sound familiar from chapter one in our hierarchy. Atoms formed compounds, compounds form cells. So let's look a little bit more about atoms. Atoms are made of three things. We want to know what we call them what's going on with electrical charge because it turns out that electricity and electrical charge is very important chemically and then we want to know where each of these three component parts is located in an atom so we start out by saying protons and remember that abbreviation thing your textbook uses a P with a plus, plus to indicate a positive electrical charge Now sometimes you see the P with a plus sometimes you just see the plus but that indicates a positive charge, and those are found in the nucleus of an atom. The nucleus is the center, the core, the very middle physically. Along with the protons, we also have neutrons in the nucleus. Neutrons are neutral. Their very name means they do not have any electrical charge. doesn't matter how many you have of them, zero electrical charge. I've seen the abbreviation for this, an N, which is what your textbook uses, N for neutral. I've seen it as a zero just to indicate zero charge, or a buster symbol, you know, zero with a slash through it, once again indicating no, zero electrical charge. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Sometimes we just see a little negative because these are negatively charged atomic particles, but your textbook uses an E with a negative indicating electrons. Electrons are found buzzing around, moving around, constantly orbiting the nucleus. We call those orbital shells. We call those levels, energy layers. Your textbook prefers the term shell. So atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And a good ex idea is to look at an example, sort of visualize all of these component parts. So I pick a pretty one. It's not one that we typically find in the human body, but it's a good example because helium has two of everything. Two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Notice the charge is indicated there. And if we visualize this helium in the nucleus in the center, we have some red and white, so those are the protons and the neutrons. And then spinning around, we got a nice patri patriotic thing going here in blue. Those are the electrons traveling in the orbitals, traveling in the electron shells. A couple of things that we need to know about charges, the positive charge, negative charge. One thing is that charges attract. That's important chemically. The other thing is that charges, opposite charges, will cancel each other. So in the case of helium, you have two positive charges exactly equal to the two negative charges. They cancel each other out with nothing left over. So we see that overall negative, excuse me, overall neutral charge. Now what makes helium helium is this unique number. So this is a very important term in chemistry. We talk about atomic number. An atomic number straight up represents the number of protons in the nucleus. So in the example that we just looked at, helium, helium's atomic number would be two. In fact, what makes it chemically helium is that number. No other element has two protons, only helium. So the atomic number identifies the atom and is unique. So we see that terminology. Chemists think this is a very important, well it is a very important uh, concept, atomic number. So here we have carbon, another important element in our own body. And we have a number here, sort of the way we abbreviate, subscript in front of the atomic symbol. C is the atomic symbol for carbon. We see this number. That number in that location indicates atomic number. So this tells us that carbon has six protons. A few other examples, H hydrogen has one proton, that's its atomic number. The atomic number for oxygen is 8. The atomic number for phosphate is 15. We're not memorizing these numbers. We're just recognizing that if you see a number in this location, it tells you how many protons. Now look at H for hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton. Its atomic number is 1. Could hydrogen ever have two protons? 
Well, the answer is no, because then it wouldn't be hydrogen. It would be helium. Atomic number is unique to each element. That tells us what's going on with the number of protons. And if this element is neutral, meaning doesn't have an overall charge, it'll have the same number of electrons. So let's think that through with a quick example. Carbon, here we know it has six protons. Those are the positive charges. That's what the number six means, six positive. If it's neutral, it would cancel out an equal number of electrons. You'd have to have six electrons. The first one would cancel the first one. The second one would cancel the second one. The third positive would cancel the third negative. Fourth, fifth, sixth, no positives left over, no negatives left over. If carbon is neutral, it has six protons. We know that because of this number that we see on the screen, but we also recognize it would have to have six equal number, six electrons. That's atomic number. We also have mass number. Now if you've taken a previous chemistry class or biology 112 here on campus, your textbook prefers atomic weight, but that's an AKA. Your textbook goes with mass number. It's essentially everything in the nucleus. So it's the number of protons, we already know that number, plus we're going to add that to the number of neutrons. Once again, that's everything that we find in the nucleus. And we have a special place to put that. Um, superscript in front of the atomic symbol, that number 12 in this example, is carbon's mass number. So we look at a variety of these. What is the mass number for hydrogen? It's that top number, 1. What is the mass number for oxygen? It's that top number, 16. Now if we know our mass number, and we know our atomic number, mass number is the top, atomic number is the bottom, we can figure out how many neutrons we have. It's a matter of subtracting the bottom number from the top. Let's look at carbon. If we have 12 protons plus neutrons, that's our definition, and we subtract out the bottom number, that's the number of protons, protons plus neutrons, minus protons, whatever's left is neutrons. So 12 minus 6, carbon, if we had this information in front of us, we could determine that carbon has six neutrons. Hydrogen, top number minus the bottom number, uh, mass number minus atomic number, one minus one, that's a zero. Turns out hydrogen is an interesting little element because it doesn't have any neutrons. Well, what about phosphate? 31, that's protons plus neutrons, minus 15, that's just the protons, whatever's left, 16 neutrons. So if you're given all of this information, you know quite a lot about an element. You know its atomic symbol, that's the shorthand. If you see one of these blocks, you know atomic number, that's the bottom number, that's the number of protons. It equals the number of electrons if it's neutral. The mass number at the top, with a little bit of a calculation, can tell you how many neutrons you have in an element. We're not memorizing these numbers, we're just understanding what they mean and how to interpret them if I give you one of these blocks on a quiz or on, a, or on an exam. Okay, so it turns out that the number of protons, that's atomic number, cannot change. But you can fiddle with everything else, meaning protons is always fixed, but you can change the number of neutrons, you can change the number of electrons. When you change the number of neutrons, you get what are called isotopes. Isotopes have a different number of neutrons, but the same mass number or the same atomic weight. So we're fiddling with the number of neutrons. The reason isotopes are important is they can be radioactive, and sometimes they're used diagnostically. And we can determine what's going on with a scan using radioactive isotopes. And don't you sound smart? Don't you sound like a real chemist when you use that term, radioactive isotope? Let's look at an example. Here's carbon. We use carbon as an example a lot because it's one of the fundamental chemicals, elements in our body. Um, carbon, we know it's carbon because C for carbon, C for carbon. We know it's carbon because it has an atomic number of six, six on the bottom there. That number can't change, but we change the top number. That's an indication that the number of neutrons is different. In the first element of carbon, to figure out the number of neutrons, 12 minus six, that first carbon has six neutrons. The second carbon, C14, 14 minus 6, that carbon has 8 neutrons. By definition, these two atoms are isotopes of each other. They're the same element, but they have a different number 
of neutrons, that top number, is different. Okay, the electrons themselves, they are the ones that are buzzing around or moving around in electron shells, and we can use that term shell, sometimes we see layer, orbital, uh, but they want to be as close, electrons, negatively charged particles, want to be as close as possible to the nucleus. The reason, physically, they want, they're drawn towards the nucleus, because the nucleus is where the positive charges are, the protons. Remember we said opposite charges opposites attract. So negatives want to be near, they're drawn to the positive. So they're going to want to be as close as possible to the center. But there's only so much room that's going to allow electrons to be next to the nucleus. So we have sort of an outline. We're looking at electrons. They want to be towards the center, towards the middle. That's where the action is. That's where the positive charge is. So they're going to form these shells. The closer shells are coveted, the closer to the middle are coveted because those are the closest to the positive. But room in those shells, room in those layers, room in those rows is limited. And here's how it works. The innermost shell, that's going to be the smallest, the closest to the protons, that's best seats in the house, they can only hold two electrons. So seating is extremely limited. But if you have, so visualize, best seats in the house, closest to the nucleus. But if you're the third electron on the scene, you got to go to the next row. Next row's got a little bit more room. It can hold eight electrons. It turns out all other rows, the third row, the fourth row, the fifth row, the seventh row, they all can hold eight electrons. The only one that's different is the innermost. It can only hold two, but that's always going to be in play because that's where all the electrons want to be. They're going to fill these shells, fill these rows, from the innermost to the outermost. Those are our energy shells. Now we talked about the idea of being neutral, where the number of protons, positive, is equal to the number of electrons, negative. They all cancel each out with nothing left over. But it turns out that's not always the case. You can change the number of electrons, and when you do that, you create ions. Ion, by definition, is an atom with a charge. Well, there are only two options here. You're either positively charged or negatively charged. So we've got terminology for each of those. You know, scientists love to put specific terms on stuff. A cation is a positively charged ion, and an anion is a negatively charged ion. So cation you'll see with a little positive, anion you'll see with a negative. This is an indication that they don't have an equal number of protons and neutrons. We fiddled with the number of electrons resulting in an extra positive or two or an extra negative or two. Cation, anion. Now these are opposites and opposites attract. That brings us to our first type of chemical bond. Bond once again is an association where atoms are sticking together. The first reason, the first strategy why atoms would stick together is because they love each other. That's an ionic bond. A cation, positively charged, is attract, is attract physically, magnetically drawn to an anion. Positive loves negative, and they're going to stick together, formed by the attraction physical magnetic attraction of oppositely charged atoms. Let's look at an example. Here we have sodium and chlorine, and sodium is a positive electrical charge, so it's a cation. Notice we write sodium Na, it's the atomic symbol for sodium, with a positive to indicate it's a cation. Chloride, chlorine, Cl with a negative. We put these two crazy kids together and they're going to be drawn together. They're going to attract towards each other and they're going to bond, forming a compound. When atoms bond together, they form a compound. Sodium chloride in this case, that's table salt, one of the examples that we used earlier. Now notice that the Na and the Cl no longer have the positive and negative when you put them together in the compound because overall they cancel and the compound is neutral. Sodium chloride, as an example, if you were to pull these two apart, get in there and disassociate or break the bond, um, they would keep their charge, meaning if we pulled sodium out of this relationship, it would still be positive. If we pulled chlorine away from this relationship, it would still be negative. And if we release them, they would go right back together. That's an ionic bond. The motivation to stay together is love, attraction. Second type of chemical bond is what we call a 
covalent bond and it's just a different relationship between atoms. In this case, uh, they're not, uh, there's not an overall charge that's drawing them. They are sticking together because they're wanting to share electrons. Electrons are sort of precious and you need just the right amount of them and in order to get the right amount sometimes you have to take turns with electrons and that's what happens in a covalent bond. Hydrogen is an example. Each hydrogen has one electron. It wants a second electron but it can't find one on its own but it can find another hydrogen in the same circumstance. So each hydrogen wants two electrons but it only has one. So what they do is they come together and they share that electron. So hydrogen number one is covalently bonded to hydrogen number two. They stick together. That's a bond. They stay together in order to facilitate the sharing. In chemistry, we draw a little dashed line between atoms, and that indicates this specific relationship. A dashed line means it's a covalent bond. So sometimes you don't see the line. We just would say H2. These, or, these atoms are in a relationship. But if you do see the line, that's an indication that this is a sharing relationship. And you can have one line shared. You can have two lines, meaning a double covalent bond, and share more than one electron. And so here we have two oxygens, a little equal sign, but one line indicates one electron is being shared. The second line indicates a second electron is being shared. That's a double covalent bond. You can have a triple covalent bond where you have three lines indicating one, two, three electrons are being shared. See in the bottom here, carbon to carbon is a triple bond, but carbon to each hydrogen is just a single covalent bond. So the lines give you an indication of the specific relationship between partners. This is a nice even relationship when we form covalent bonds, but it turns out that sometimes atoms share electrons unequally so they're not equal partners, and this creates polar molecules. Polar molecules form when electrons, these sort of precious these precious particles, are shared unequally. So someone in the relationship and the partnership is stronger, uh, pulls on the electron, keeps the electron longer. The idea of sharing, sometimes we think about sharing something evenly. I get it for 50% of the time, my partner gets it for 50% of the time. Then I get a turn 50% of the time, then my partner gets a turn 50% of the time. That's equal sharing. But what we're talking about here in a polar molecule is unequal sharing. So we're still in a relationship, but I get it 75% of the time, my partner gets it 25% of the time. I get it 75% of the time, my partner gets it 25% of the time. We're still sharing, but unequally. And the reason that's important is what we're sharing chemically is a negatively charged particle. So if I hold on to that negatively charged particle longer, if I have the lion's share most of the time that electron is with me, then most of the time I have an extra negative. Most of the time I'm negatively charged. Now it's not a full complete anion, it's not a full complete ionic charge because I don't have the electron 100% of the time. That's what an ionic bond would be all about. This is just most of the time. If I'm holding on to the electron for the longer amount of time, I'm mostly negative. And my partner, who only gets it every so often, is mostly positive. So polar molecules are going to result in this mismatch, this unequal or uneven sharing of electrons, resulting in areas around the molecule that have a charge. A good example of a polar molecule and an important molecule to our body is water, H2O. We see oxygen in the middle. Notice the dashed lines, uh, single electron being shared with hydrogen number one, single electron being shared with hydrogen number two. In this example, oxygen has a high electronegativity. We don't need to worry about that term, but it's stronger. It's essentially the bully. So when these molecules are sharing electrons, the electrons are represented by the little blue dots here, they're usually closer to the oxygen because oxygen is stronger, gets the lion's share of time with them. So that means that the area around the middle of this molecule, kind of the zone around the oxygen, is mostly negative because that's mostly where the electrons are. But not always, it's not a full charge. Occasionally the hydrogens get it, but mostly it's around the oxygen. What that means is the areas or the zones around each hydrogen sticking out are usually, kind of more often than not, slightly positive. That's what a polar molecule is. There's unequal sharing, 
and there are regions or zones that are more or less positive or negative. And those slight charges are going to lead to our third and final type of chemical bond. These are called hydrogen bonds. They don't just occur during between hydrogens, so this is a general term in chemistry, but they form from the attraction of polar molecules. The idea is charge, even if it's not a full charge, charge is still charge. A little bit positive, a little bit negative, they're still going to be attracted to each other. So like magnets, the positive end of a polar molecule is going to attract the negative end of surrounding polar molecules. And likewise, the negative end is going to attract the positive end of surrounding polar molecules. So they all kind of arrange themselves, they turn themselves, so that the positive, mostly positive ends and the mostly negative ends are together. That's the relationship within a hydrogen bond. And then we have this idea of a chemical reaction. We'll sort of finish up with this idea. A chemical reaction is a way of describing what's going on. So let's look at an example chemical reaction. Now before you freak out, we're not memorizing this and it is in the notes, but we should recognize a few of these compounds. That first one is glucose, C6H12O6. Then we've got O2. O2 is breathable or atmospheric oxygen. It's what we're breathing in to our respiratory system. We got a little arrow there. CO2, that's carbon dioxide. That's what we breathe out in our respiratory system and a little bit of water. So we're not memorizing this reaction, but we should recognize the parts. We have that arrow. Everything in front of the arrow, in this case, in this example, glucose and oxygen, are what are known as the reactants of a chemical reaction. They are going to react or mix with each other. I like to think about these as the ingredients in a chemical reaction. Just like you think about a recipe has ingredients, what's going to mix together? Those are the reactants. You could have two reactants, three reactants, ten reactants, just like you could have a different number of ingredients. They are what go in to the reaction. The arrow indicates the actual reaction. What happens? They're going to mix. And then the chemicals on the back side of the arrow in this case carbon dioxide and water, are known as the products. Sort of at the end of the chemistry, at the end of the action, what did you get? In this case there are two products, you might have one product or three products, but you get carbon dioxide and water out of this chemical reaction. We need to recognize these two component parts. We're not making chemical equations, we're not balancing chemical equations. You might have done that in a previous chemistry class, but if I give you an equation like this example, it would be to able to label the ingredients, we call those the reactants, and what comes out at the end when it's all over, those are the products. Now I use this particular chemical reaction as an example because it is a very important one for us. This is cellular respiration, and we're going to see this again, so I just kind of introduce it here. But cellular respiration is how we break down the sugar that we bring into our body and how we produce ATP energy. This occurs in the mitochondria of our cells. We'll be talking about that in another chapter. So those are specific structures, specific internal cellular structures called organelles that help the cell process and generate chemical energy. Chemical energy for the cell is ATP. And this chemical reaction, cellular respiration, where we take glucose and oxygen. This is why, by the way, we have to breathe in oxygen, because it's an ingredient in making energy. And then we're going to breathe out carbon dioxide, keep a little bit of the water. But cellular respiration is how we generate ATP. We're going to see this again, so I just use it as a nice example. There are three things that can influence chemical reactions, the rate or the speed of chemical reactions. The first is temperature. And in general, the warmer it is, the faster it moves, the faster it happens, accelerates, increases, or speeds up the rate. Now that's true to a point, things can get too hot and burn up, but in general, warm, warmer, warmer, even warmer, things are happening more rapidly. Second factor that can affect chemical reactions is concentration. In this case, we mean amount or number, number of reactants. If you just have a, one reactant um, bouncing around, things aren't going to happen as rapidly as if you had a whole bunch of those reactants. They're more likely to bounce into each other. They're more likely to react. So increasing concentration tends to speed up chemical rates. And the third, react, the third thing that can affect 
the rate, the speed, are what are known as catalysts. Biologically, chemical catalysts are enzymes. These are proteins. These are chemicals that when added or mixed in with a chemical reaction are going to lower what we call the activation energy. It takes a certain amount of energy to kind of get things going. And enzymes are essentially like a coupon. They're going to discount the amount of energy it takes to do something chemically. And if it costs less, it happens more rapidly. So chemical reactions can be affected by temperature, concentration, and enzymes. We're going to next sort of shift this information that we've learned in the first part of chapter one and take it to our own bodies and look at organic compounds. And we're going to be continuing that in the second video. So there's a second video on the second half of this chapter. And right now that takes us to the end of chapter two, part one. All right. I appreciate your attention. Please watch the second part. Thank you.